forward to the next few minutes together. Let me look in each of you. Yes. Good morning, Oak Hill. I'm glad to see you here. This moment reminds me of many blessings that we have to worship God together. And I am looking forward to the blessing that God intends for you with this lesson. I love to think and pray and work and then God uh, blesses you in ways that I could never know, but he does. So it's great to be a vessel in that sense to bless your life. The glory land way. All spiritual matters relate to being in that glory land way. I love to hold up my copy of this book, the Bible, and say it is the fully inspired, inerrant word from our creator to the creation. It is the standard in all religious matters, and we therefore build our lives upon it. We can, with the word and our submission to it, live beyond this world eternally with the Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to the message today. You know, I'm very grateful for that. Romans chapter 1 and 2, Romans chapters 1 and 2, uh, talks about people who are totally alienated from God. Totally alienated. And among many descriptors, it's insightful that one of the terms describing the ungodly is unthankfulness. Neither were they thankful. Chapter 1, verse 21. In the academic world, and the Barclays commentary is well respected, uh, they call ingratitude the blindest of all sins. The blindest of all sins. Other people call it the root of all other sins. And you can think about this later, how ingratitude could fuel envy and greed and theft and hate and murder and the such like. So I hope that we are staying in the glory land way. Uh, we have a commission from our Lord and telling the world that Jesus saves today, Matthew 28, the great commission that his disciples receive and that those who are saved by him want to follow. It's worded this way on the screen for our easy sharing and saying together. Would you say it with me? Equipping disciples to make new disciples. Amen. Uh, the very fact that we are having this lesson on the theme again today, past the date of the holiday, preaches its own point. I wanted to take all that has been said to this point <laughs> and to just share some true stories with you to help those principles stick and maybe in a way that we can apply to our own lives, help us be more consistent. We say amen to these points in the service, in the church building, for example, but it's not always easy to practice them in our homes. So I hope to help you in this way, expressing an attitude of gratitude. Our holidays lesson last week was appropriate. It focused on being thankful to God, giving Him full adoration, developing our appreciation towards Him so that our worship could all be directed towards praising God. And that was appropriate. I appreciated the timely lesson last Wednesday night because of the hour difference, time zone difference, was able to watch. And it's now up for everyone to watch. Austin's message last Wednesday focused our attention on the people in our lives. Also a blessing, tremendous blessing from God. So to book into this holiday theme, this Thanksgiving week, we're going to spend a few minutes focusing on now the often ignored dynamic of the command. Ignored? We've been focusing on everything all this time. What could be ignored? I thought we said it all. Sometimes a given still needs to be spoken because sometimes it's not thought until someone says it. This command, this often ignored dynamic of the command would bless so every congregation, so many congregations if they just did it. And so often it is so much of a given, we take it for granted. We may not even notice it. Uh, this, in fact, is not a suggestion. It is a command, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2, 518, to have an attitude of gratitude. Yes, God commands us to be thankful. For some, that's step one. 
But the practice that helps nurture this is the next phase. God's command to give thanks. To not just possess it, but to express it. And I hope you get everything from the lesson that's intended, but that's the key point. Not just possess it, but to express it. That prevents a lot of problems and helps a lot of blessings. Who would have thought that thanksgiving means giving thanks? Mind blown, right? Turning a noun into a verb. And that's what we're going to do today. It makes all the difference in our experience. And so I pray that, I really do pray that everything that we say helps generate within our hearts any necessary conviction for change. To make any change necessary to allow you and I to practice this command better and to carry it out more. So let's let some of these stories just uh, inspire us. So Now first, I do have to say, saying thank you, biblical gratitude is far beyond the superficial thank you very much come again that you get when you buy a burger at a fast food drive through No. One of my Webster's dictionaries has this as a definition for gratitude. A feeling... Emphasize that word feeling of thankful appreciation for favors or benefits received without payment or obligation. A warm, appreciative response to kindness. Now, our response to others is because of the kindness that God has shown to us. All right, that's a key side point. But I like this definition. Does it describe us well? Let me ask you. Do you and I radiate a spirit of gratitude and gratefulness? If, if uh, years from now, a preacher is standing at your funeral service, eulogizing your life, and the preacher says, he or she just radiated a spirit of gratitude in everything he or she has done. Would people afterwards have to come up to look in the casket to see if they're still thinking and talking about the same person? Say, I never knew him to her to be that way. Do we radiate a spirit of gratitude? If we do not, we need to ask God's help in this matter. It's very important. And like I said, it affects our whole experience of life and your own personal joy. I do want to say also, though, that <clears throat> saying thank you, books have been written, and I have a few books written on the power of just saying thank you because of the matters we're talking about. Those two words can be superficial, but they can mean, be so powerful because they can come from the heart of a soul that is expressing sincere, deep appreciation. And that's the key. This lesson today is to already encourage you to enrich your spiritual living, to enhance your relationships with one another, I like the homework assignment given out in class to build that relationship. To also enable us to be more effective in God's service. To build up the kingdom. So let's just talk about a few key areas where your life would be tremendously blessed with the enhancement, just turn it up a bit, of saying thank you and meaning it. Expression of sincere gratitude. Here's one area. To the family. Some of you saw a lot of relatives this past week. The very fact that we're having this lesson after that date reminds us to practice this all year round. And let's look first at children to parents. Why not? Let's look at children to parents. What a great example our Lord is in everything. And before his death, even while on the cross, when you can't physically do much... One of the last things our Lord physically did upon this earth is to make sure his mother was honored and taken care of. Isn't that something? John chapter 19, verses 26 and following. Whether we are eight or 108, we have an obligation before God in this matter to give parents due honor. And I like that phrase, due honor. We come from different homes, I know. 
but God thought it was important enough that children respect parents, that he made it a command. This isn't a Mother's Day or Father's Day lesson. We talk about Ephesians 6 all the time on those days. But we know those verses, verses 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor father and mother. The first commandment with promise. Wow. You know, how would you feel to know that the Greek word translated honor here is strong enough that could be justifiably argued the word worship. You could justifiably use the word worship in place of that. Now, I know that ungodly people would abuse the connotations of that. But just think about that. How many of us who are privileged to still have our parents living consider the importance of expressing this worshipful type attitude, a reverence, a respect towards those who've done so much for us? So much for us. Is it possible to know the value of a dollar before you start working hard? I don't know. But I read a report uh, from 2014. Back in 2014, the USDA says that the average cost of raising a child to the age of 18 was a staggering $245,000. I saw my parents working hard growing up. Working hard to provide. I sometimes wonder what all was factored into that figure. I think it's sometimes good to go without, to appreciate what you've got. How many children, either still growing up in their parents' home or now on their own, how many children every day show their parents a quarter million dollars worth of appreciation? I submit to you that the spirit that constantly yells at them and carries contentions with them and being unfair with them and refusing to listen or to cooperate are not methods of honoring our parents. In the years prior to my moving here, I preached a lot more funerals uh, than I have here. It's interesting, but I remember some that other preachers frankly didn't want to touch. One of the greatest tragedies that I know of is when a young person is standing by the side of a casket with a parent inside. Premature departure of planet Earth. And that young person is just welled over with grief and sorrow, knowing that they did not express appreciation to the parent while he or she was living, and the knowledge that it is now finite. It is absolute. It is too late. Do you know the story behind the song that David Gates wrote, Everything I Own? Some of you remember this song. It's it's back there. Um, And I remember the first time I heard it over the speakers. Um, Some thought it was a brilliant take on the pain that you feel when you still have love in your heart for the person after a breakup. The words could be interpreted that way. But here's the backstory. He wrote these lyrics in the funeral parlor of his dad with similar tones that I just expressed. And and, and let me read that song to you. You sheltered me from harm, kept me warm, kept me warm. You gave my life to me, set me free, set me free. The finest years I ever knew were all the years I spent with you. You never said too much, but still you showed the way. And I knew from watching you that nobody else could ever know the part of me that can't let go. He says, you taught me how to love what it's of, what it's of. I will give anything I own. I would give up my heart, my life, my home. I would give everything I own just to have you back again. He then challenges us with stanza three. Is there someone you know, you're loving them so, but taking them all for granted? You may lose them one day, someone takes them away, and they don't hear the words you long to say. 
I would give anything I own, give up my life, heart, and home, everything I own, just to have you back again. I think we can appreciate the heart that wrote those lyrics and the sentiment within it. But if preventable, I pray that none of us lose a parent with that enormous grief and sorrow in our hearts. Let's start obeying this command so that we don't, okay? Let's make sure that we obey this command so that we have that peace. This coin has another side. Let's look at it from parents to children. On this matter, I'm just an observer, so I have a few questions for parents. Parents, holding on to that agape love, of course, no matter how difficult it might be, do you show appreciation to your children? And when I say show, I don't mean say, oh, they, they, don't, they know I love them. That's not the answer to the question. Do you express verbally and physically in all the things that you do, in word and deed? Do you express appreciation to your kids? As much as I love and we love the story of Joseph rising to power in Egypt to save the people, I trust that God would have found another way. You know where I'm going with that? I'm going way back to this. Um, because all of Joseph's suffering and, and their own grief was traced back to a father's fundamental error of showing favoritism in Genesis 37. Jacob um, may have held appreciation for his other children, but we can gather that he somehow must have failed to convey the equality of value, no matter their differences. Untold grief on the family for decades. Bitterness and resentment and rebellion. You don't want that. Parents, avoid provoking your children to wrath. How is that done? This is the answer, expression of gratitude. Do you look actively search for things to express appreciation to your kids about, to encourage. Do you express gratitude when your children do what you say? Mind you, or respect certain rules in some positive way? Now, some people must say, well, they're supposed to obey me. Well, the fact is that no matter the consequences, they very well can choose not to. Do you express appreciation when they do? Mind what you say. Do you show appreciation when they try to help you? If they're still at that stage, that they want to try to help, even if they maybe can't. When they try, do you appreciate that heart and encourage it? So do you show appreciation when they try and fail? You know, I believe if, um, if more parents did this, they would fall all over themselves, finding ways to try to help, and the world would be a so far better place. I had my chores. I figured out one day, though, I'm very young, I figured out that my parents would appreciate coming home after a long day of work, seeing all the clean dishes that are now dried. We didn't have a washer back then. Now put up. They didn't have to do that. And they did. They, come, they came home. They appreciated the dishes put up. They first expressed that appreciation. And then they afterwards carefully instructed and guided me as to the proper location of where all those dishes go. I didn't put anything where they belong. But I do wonder, where would I be now? Who would I be if my parents had frequently skipped step one? I don't think I'd be here right now. Do you show appreciation when they try and fail? A preacher friend of mine is a referee for all kinds of sports games. And he says, the kids are often great. Uh, they have great sportsmanship. They're learning. They're growing. They're excited. The parents, he has to kick some of them out of the game sometimes, right? Oh, boy. At one high school wrestling match, two boys were paired for a round. And they were paired by weight, not by age. So there was a lack of experience on the younger one. But the younger boy was giving the older boy, gentlemen, just great competition. He was doing an exceptional job. The father of that young man was yelling so loud, we think, we think cheering his son on. Whew, it meant a lot to him. You could hear him all over the gymnasium. Well, 
just a few seconds before the round was over, uh, the older person by the experience was able to get the younger one in a pen he couldn't get out of, and the, the hand count came, the match was over, the younger one had lost that round. That father swore curses upon his son, yelling at him tra tragically, and then fiercely, I should say, and then marched out of the gymnasium. The silent sympathy from the crowd meant quite nothing compared to when you would turn and, my friend says, see this grief-stricken, so heart-sunken sorrow on this young man's face. Apparently to this father, value is indigenous from victory. Not a good environment. Discouragement can kill the spirit and provoke to wrath. But encouragement can motivate us to get up one more time. That can make all the difference. Encouragement can fuel our motivation, our, our perception of self-worth, and help us serve, which brings so many blessings. And this is so true in the church. If we want children to be involved in church matters and to stay in the church with Christ forever, encouragement is essential. When the youth get up and lead a prayer at the speed of light or when they stumble through a song or they misspeak something when they read it, I love how Oak Hill speaks positively to them afterwards. In that instant moment when they're done, the amen, the encouragement, they feel that. They won't forget it. I, uh, I love to see afterwards those encouraging statements. But I have a question for you. Just a rhetorical comment. Answer it to yourself. Hope to hopefully never forget it. What is it that we think is any different to encouraging those who always serve in those roles. Are they no longer needing encouragement? I remember the first time I read scripture. Whew, shaking the whole pew in nervous anticipation. People were scared for me, actually. They were wondering about me. Nervous is an understatement. I made several mistakes. I've since preached on the passage that I've misspoke so many words on. But that's interesting. I, uh, I remember once for a prayer. Once for a prayer, I literally said, forgive us of our blessings, and Lord, thank you for our sins, and please, I do not encourage you to utter that same petition. Oh, boy. But I remember the name of the person who I didn't have much interaction with, but I remember the name of the person who first came up to me afterwards and said, keep on keeping on. That, that was his phrase, George McClendon, but keep on keeping on. Why do I remember his name? Where would I have been if I had not received encouragement but criticism at that point? Parents, you know that world will try to tear your children down. You know it. This is where you step in and rise to God's call to prevent that discouragement. Mark chapter 9, verse 42, Ephesians 6, 4, and Colossians 3, 21. This is done by showing them appreciation. And then, as was mentioned in class, you can give them that good counsel and correction, that admonishment, because you have their respect on a deeper level. Also within the family, I have to mention this, between spouses. We've taught whole series on this before, too. Those videos are just sitting on Vimeo waiting to be watched. I was the type of teenager that I would attend, of course, all the services at the congregations my dad preached at, the classes, the sermons, morning, evening. I was also the type that attended the early services all around Nashville area. I cherish those memories, those days. I was the type of person who, if they had a church library, I would go there and check out everything in that church library, including marriage seminar videos. I said, why not get a head start on a future role that I might live in just to do it right? Over the past 20 years of my work, I've seen many couples struggling, and it would bewilder me. And then I realized, maybe it's because they haven't seen those same sessions. Ephesians 5.33 has two statements in there. Let's look at the first one. Ephesians 5.33, husbands, love your wives even as yourself. There's no room in marriage for selfishness. 
And we're married to Christ. A little funny story. A little funny story about a wife who was impressively nice enough to keep preparing her husband a little breakfast every morning. Because she seemed to always guess wrong about how he wanted his eggs cooked. If she scrambled it, he wanted it fried. If, he, if she fried it, she, he said he, he wanted it scrambled. And the only thing consistent was the bickering. And no one wants to be around constant griping. That usually represents a deeper matter to address. But the very spirit sometime of bickering and complaining is the problem, as it is in this case. Um, one day she got smart and said, I'm going to make two eggs. I'm going to scramble one, fry the other. He can take the one he wants. And so he was coming down, sees the option. He was bewildered. And then he starts complaining again. And she says, listen, listen, you can take the one you want. I'll eat the other one so that you have nothing to complain about. Well, that just made him more irritated. And he says, yes, I do have something to complain about. You scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> yeah, thanks. He got a life-changing come to Jesus talk that morning and probably deserved every bit of it. But uh, if we miss what's most important, we'll fail to express it. Thank you, my love. For all the things that your love motivates you to do for me. Thank you. I was a microwave conditioned bachelor. Some of those habits still come out. If we have leftover manwich, sloppy joe in the fridge. I'm, if I'm not thinking, and that's a normal, well, I'm always thinking of something, but if I'm not conscious of what, what I'm doing, I'll take a plastic spoon, dump it onto a folded paper towel, put it in the microwave, transfer it to a slice, save washing a saucer or plate. I'm that type of a guy, right? Drink out of the bottle, not the glass. I don't miss those days, all right? But uh, habit's hard to break. I remember getting so eager for the time that I would share with Terry and one of our date days. We watched a movie at her place, and, and she cooked for me I was never I was speechless with gratitude I never felt I felt like royalty I was so filled with gratefulness for what she had done they say that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach well it wasn't the yummy food as much as the work behind doing that and the spirit that motivated the work one university had a study the mindset of a spendthrift wife when, there, when the budget was tight and there were primary needs in the home, the wife would still go out and just waste money. I know that's gender neutral, I guess, in that sense. But, but what's going on in this? They did some studies. Now, some of them had physical and, and legitimate spiritual concerns to address. But, but the majority of them, here's what they concluded. That they were trying to compensate for what is lacking in the home. These things that you purchase are telling yourself, hey, you're pretty important when that's missing in the home and that could be given easily and not cost the husband a penny. Do we think of our wives as needing this type of appreciation? I hope we do not think that we are above giving this type of appreciation. One elderly husband tells his story. His sweet wife had become very ill, bedridden, he was lovingly tending to all of her needs, of course. There was a gospel meeting that came to town. He called in help so that he could attend. The sermon was on matters kind of like this. And he returned home with the resolve to put that sermon into practice before they go to sleep that night. He showered her with his gratefulness and grateful heart. He would say things like, Honey, I want you to know that I've missed you this past hour because I deeply cherish more than anything else in my life, you having been in my life. All these years that we've shared together, I deeply cherish every memory. You've been my partner through thick and thin, and you've done so much to help me make it through. I could not have done it without you. I don't know what I would have done 
You are God's blessing to me. I feel that I can never match the love that you have shown. And he just keeps on going in the effort of raising the children, all the tasks you've tended to, the time we've shared together, the bond, bondness of our spirit, the oneness of our soul. I just want you to know that I deeply appreciate you more than words can express. Tears streaming down her face after that. And of course, he wiped those tears because she was too weak to do anything else. They went to sleep that night. He woke up. She did not. He later wrote that preacher. And he says, I want you to know how grateful I am for that sermon. Because now I know that the last words my wife ever heard on the face of the planet is how much I love her. And I hope that the thought of telling your wife I love you does not sound strange. If there is, I could recommend some great books. In fact, I encourage you to make a note. Love and Respect. Love and Respect. That is a great book just about 15 years ago. I have a few copies if you're interested. An audio copy. If you're like me, I don't want to read. I do that all the time. I want to hear it. I'm good. You know, this coin has another side. The wife to the husband. I, I, I praise and esteem the role of wives. Because us husbands have our piece of work. Ephesians 3, 5, 33b says, Let the wife see that she reverence her husband. That's a strong word. And no doubt men have some type of an ego complex. But I will say this. Nagging is not the language for motivating necessary change of behavior. It is poison. Though it's natural, it is poison. A psychologist was approached by a woman. She wanted a divorce. She was fed up. I pestered my husband for weeks to be responsible on anything. This built on for years, of course. And he thought he, he was approached with this question. She wanted to cause him harm. He says, the question that he was asked by her how can I make my husband deeply hurt when I leave him? He thought for a moment and said, Well, if he's truly a good-willed man, a good-willed man, then here's what you do. For a few months, treat him like he's the, the, the most important thing in your life. That he can do no wrong. That he's the greatest thing ever. And when you leave him, he will be so torn up inside, disoriented, that he'll feel the pain of severance and rejection and loss. Well, months went by. He would keep an eye on the divorce notices. He thought he may have just missed it. They were in town walking. Well, actually, he was in town walking, and he crossed her. He saw her in town and said, hey, a few months ago, you visited me asking for uh, what you could do building up to a divorce to cause hurt and harm on your husband. Huh. She gasped and said, oh, divorce, oh no, listen, we've had, we have a whole new relationship now. And she went on and on and on. And then she kind of was embarrassed and said, you know, the, what you told me was what I needed to do to make him more of the husband that he needed to be. Now in this case, ladies, the good-willed nature in his spirit to do his best came out and it worked. She learned how important it was to build up her husband. I often say my wife is my best cheerleader. Helping me fulfill the role that God wants for me in that role. Well, I'm thankful that we've spent the past 13 weeks talking about how we are to show that appreciation to our church family, to our church. Because I can be briefer now. And I knew this lesson would be uh, longer. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Less time to study throughout the week with the vacation, and yet I have more time. One of the phases of study is to narrow down, narrow down, keep saying it. But I think that, the, like we said in class and implied, the more we learn about a person, what they do and what they go through, the more we can appreciate them. Are you taking time to conscientiously Verbally let your brethren know how much you appreciate them. How long has it been since you've expressed appreciation to your elders? Now, some of you could say, I did it last week. Some of you, I hear what you say. That's good. Some of you could not be able to say, I've ever done it. From a human standpoint, 
There are many reasons why a person would not desire that role. Unjust criticism is one of them. So often the brethren are so aloof, ignorant of the trials, that their words, their very words of ignorance, test their endurance. It was a rhetorical question in class, but I don't mind to tell you that the, the answer, every day. Does that surprise you? I'm not going to let the devil win, though. That shouldn't surprise you either. If I stay faithful, there's no way he will. And he knows he's going to lose. We read the Revelation, the end of the book. We know who loses. I'm not going to be on his side. But he sure does test you. Tremendous stress on the family. Focus on elders again. Enormous demands on time. Restrictions on personal mobility to enjoy oneself in recreation. Limitation. Limitation on personal freedoms. Problematic scenarios at every turn. Folks, I'm telling you what. In a way, you'd have to be out of your mind, right? It seems like you'd have to be out of your mind to want that role. You serve your heart out, and then the members stomp on it. Same goes for anyone devoted to a ministry, because you're working against the devil's cause. I can only figure out one reason why a person would want to be involved in such a work. They love the Lord so much that they're willing to help the brethren be more like him. When was the last time that you said to an elder, I really appreciate all your effort to try making the best decisions and the right decisions for the work you do. And while you're at it, please go to their wives. Oh, yes, you want to get their attention? I'm going to give you some notes. If you can't relate to what they go through, if you've never been in that role and seen the world from that view, you can say things like this. I really appreciate the time that you don't get to spend with your husband. I can only try to imagine the pain of loneliness and frustration with the sacrifice of your time, with the love of your life, because your husband has spent helping members with problems that, frankly, they brought upon themselves because there were some sermons somewhere, sometime they either didn't listen or didn't apply. You have an exceptional husband because you are an exceptional wife and that you love him that much to kill, still keep a smile on your face. I won't get too personal from the preacher standpoint. Greatly appreciate the comments Matt said, of course. I love how our classes can combine. You'll see that a lot more. Uh, compliment each other. But I'll focus on missionaries. Missionaries on the field can go for years without having anyone tell them how much they appreciate his devoted life, the effort taken to prepare and deliver a, a, a nice message, and the best time to encourage them is when they're here giving reports, shower them with positivity and encouragement. Build up their house, exhort them. Also, please express gratitude to the song leaders. We have great, three great song leaders here in rotation. Uh, they have a lot to think about. There's a lot to plan for. There's a lot to think about before and during. Have you ever wondered how they could forget an announcement or, or where we are in the worship and something for you to do or the page number to turn to or, and how to lingo, linger from one theme, song, melody in the head from one song and shift keys to the next song? There's a, it's not as easy as it looks. It really isn't. And please never take for granted the blessing of having serving of having sermon complimenting songs. You obviously appreciate that, and, and, and they do too, thankfully. That's not always the case in some congregations. Uh, you've heard some of the silly stories. You've even experienced them before as well. Have you ever heard and been a part of a morning service where the invitation song was, Oh, Why Not Tonight? I, 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 it was referenced Wednesday night, and I thought about that. I said, yeah, I haven't heard that song in a while. I know it happens. I'm full of glitches, too, but I honestly can't fathom that. I can't fathom that. Here's another one. There's a lesson that was focused. The preacher was focusing on one phrase, uh, uh, sacrificial service. And he would always ask the question, will there be any stars in my crown? Will there be any stars in my crown? Emphasizing service, serve, serve, serve. The closing song emphasize the phrase no not one it wasn't the message of the song you know the song but i'm thinking someone didn't think this through here how can that happen god deserves better than that there was one preacher who preached against the works of the flesh and preached against the abuse of liquor of course ah the sin of intoxication and then 
He said, I'd like to take all the liquor and dump it in the river. And, and the phrase was, dump the liquor in the river. All the liquor in the river. I don't understand how that if it was preset, maybe there was not communication, a failure to communicate. The song, the song right after is, let's all gather at the river. <laughs> Please, no. No. I hope you never experience something like that here at Oak Hill. Oh, wow. Do you show appreciation to your child's teacher? They need encouragement so, so much. Do you know who spins hours preparing the curriculum for your children to learn? If you don't, find out. Do you know who your child's teacher even is week by week? I'm not a parent, but I can't imagine not taking great interest in that avenue and expressing appreciation to those who serve and help my kids in that respect. That's very important. Kevin Roberts said that there are 5 billion people that go to bed hungry every night, but there are 7 billion people going to bed every day for, hungry for a sincere, honest showing of appreciation, a compliment, if you will. One of the ways that bitterness and wrath and anger builds in a church is when we fail to express appreciation to one another. Christian, it is our reborn nature and love for God and love for one another to express that appreciation more frequently. Jesus said in John 13, 35, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That includes what we've talked about today. Again, our response to the brethren is because of the kindness and love and mercy shown to us. Perhaps a lot of people just don't know God enough to appreciate him. I think that's the case these days. They don't know God enough to appreciate him. Maybe they haven't seen it modeled in the home. I don't know. But that's the f third and final phrase. Of course, we'll be brief for the point. We talked about this last week, so... Gratitude to our God. This must be taught early. Early. Remember the song, How I Love to Pat the Bible? The Bible. It must be taught early. There was a large congregation asking, asking a question, a survey, to their large Sunday morning attendance, grade school and junior high. They asked the children, How many of you sit down to a family meal and and thank God before any meal. 80% of those Sunday morning, Sunday school attending children didn't raise their hand. They never expressed thanks to God before eating a meal. Now, it's the problem behind that that I worry about. I can't conceive this. I can't fathom this. For Tom's sake, I'll simply say that a Sunday school teacher wrote this poem. I provided it to you last week. To build gratitude to God in your children's minds. And the adults are blessed for it as well. What do you owe God, you ask? Suppose he sent his bill. A hundred thousand dollars for the sun on the hill. Two thousand for the little brook that runs along the way. Five hundred for the nighttime. A thousand for the day. 600 for the birds that chirp and sing. 600 for the flowers that tell us when it's spring. These are the bills which every one of every clime forget. If God should charge you what you owed, you would never pay the debt. Do you build this kind of gratitude in your children's hearts? They must see it. And for the gift of forgiveness, there's no way to pay that back. There really isn't. So we give him our all, our all. Is, God's, is it God's will that we express thanks in everything? Yes, express, not just possess, express. Parents, I want to use this illustration again or reference parents for this question. As children grow up, how would you interpret their consistent, predictable, willful rejection and disobedience? How would you interpret that? Whatever you ask them to do, hey, would you do me a favor and reach that to me? No, I'm not going to do it. Would you take out the trust for me? No. How would you interpret that? 
Well, obviously, there's some problems to address, but that would be a demonstration of lack of love, lack of respect, lack of appreciation, lack of gratitude. How does God interpret a person's refusal to do the simple things that really mean so much, like baptism, like study God's word, like work, like serve, like help, and give, and so many other things. If we keep saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. And in fact, it's just going to be my way, and you're just going to have to accept it. Whoa. Did you know that, going back to the beginning of our lesson, the ungodly are ungrateful. The grateful are humble. Thank you, Lord. At the core of this lesson is the question, do you have a grateful heart enough to express it? to your brethren, and of course, ultimately to God, who has done so much for us. Do you need to put him on in baptism like Braden did yesterday and to start living a new life in Christ? Let us help you with that. Thanks for your patience and attention. Appreciate that so much. Appreciate you so much. This moment means a lot to me. What I would appreciate even more is either personal conviction or public confession if necessary to do what you need to do to get your life right with Christ and with those in your life as we stand and as